Hello and welcome to Horror Court Trash Over, the show that discusses all the masterpieces and trash to pieces of genre cinema. My name's Chris. And I'm Gary. And I w- would very much like to welcome you to our 300 episodes. Yeah. 300 times me and Gary have sat down and talked a load of shit about our favourite and least favourite movies. Time flies when you're talking shit. It's true. It's true. It's what, five years. We're approaching five years. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. is our fourth year of doing this. Which is incredible considering I said I was adamant actually yeah. that I wasn't going to do it. And uh-huh. here we are. Here we are. <laughs> uh, all these all these films later. Um discovered some favourites, discovered some stuff I wish I'd never watched. And well, you know. There's been some discoveries. Yeah. And I I did I'm quite pleased with that. Yeah. Um Yeah, you happy we discovered the Beast of Bunny? <laughs> and that, uh, now that feels like fifty years ago. Saving not Christmas five years ago. Yeah, well, that was always on the radar. <laughs> but, you know, we have discussed masterpieces as well. You know, Halloween, we've discussed Psycho, The Exorcist, Scream. Silence of the Lambs, Showgirls, you know, we've discussed a real mixed bag and it's all, it's brought us, it's all come together to bring us to this day. Oh, it's brought us closer together It's brought us closer together as a couple. Wouldn't rather be recording it with anyone else. (laughs) Um, But again, you know, we've had many great guests as well, which we're forever grateful for. And most importantly... We are so grateful that people are still listening to us. Yes. That you guys keep coming back week after week to listen to us talking shit. And it has been every single week since uh, September 2019. So thank you. I Someone's guess. listening from the beginning. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. And even if you're new, even if you're new, thank oh, you for absolutely. joining us now. Yeah. You've picked a good place to start. Yes. Because at 200, we discussed Pink Flamingos. Yeah. It was a long time coming. It was in our original logo, um, and it's one of our favourite films. And what are we discussing today? Today we're discussing my personal favourite John Waters film, Female Trouble. Yeah, from 1974. Yeah, from 1974. Um, and I, I say that it's my favourite. There's not much in it. It's difficult. I, I always say my favourite is polyester, but it... You could shuffle it around between a few of them, really. It's, yeah, it tends to be whichever one I've watched most recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I think John Waters is probably my favourite director of yeah. all time. Yeah, he's up there amongst mine. Um, he kind of encapsulates everything that this podcast is about. Yeah. Queerness, um, horror and campiness and... All that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Everything that we love about film, he encapsulates. So it's the perfect film, in my opinion, to celebrate 300 years. Mm -hmm. We are also in the month of December, and it has a pretty fucking iconic Christmas scene. That it does. So that helps. That it does. It definitely fits into our Christmas theme. It's not a Christmas film, but it does have the greatest Christmas scene ever filmed. Absolutely. Ever. Um, and I, I said that last few weeks jokingly about the uh, Christmas Evil ending and the Caroline Monroe scene in Don't Open Till Christmas. Uh, but I, I'm saying seriously now, no exaggeration, this is the greatest Christmas scene ever put to film. Yeah, yeah. The, this female trouble, and we'll, obviously we'll get into it yeah. more and more as we go through, but this and Airplane, I think, are the two funniest films. Yeah. In terms of laughing out loud, I'm mm-hmm. not an LOL kind of gal. I don't, it's not often you'll see me LOLing at the TV screen. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't find things funny. It, I, I'm not a cackler. I like, I like Real Housewives for some reason. This makes me cackle. Yeah. This film and Airplane both make me cackle from start yeah. to end. Absolutely hilarious. Mm-hmm. Perfect comedy. Yeah. Um, it is, of course, written and directed, as we've told you, by the icon that is John Waters. Uh, of course, the director of Pink Flamingos, Polyester, Hairspray, Crybaby, uh, Serial Mum, the list goes on. And 
all of them, apart from maybe uh, Dirt Shame, are all classics and all films that I have no problem revisiting because they're never getting any less funny. I'd revisit all of them. Yeah, A Dirty Shame, I feel, it was a little um, underwhelming. Yeah. A little disappointing, should I say. Um, but the filmography speaks for itself. Yeah. So many masterpieces. Still really, really excited for Liar Mouth yeah. coming out yeah. next year, Yeah, hopefully. I'm excited to see John Waters return to Chucky. Yes. Yes. And his taste level is impeccable. Uh-huh. As well, he loves putting out his top 10 films at yeah. the end of the year. If anyone's seen this year's list, um, or seen any of the films, some of them, he does go a little... <laughs> um, niche. Niche, should we say. Some very random films that even we've never heard of. Yeah. <laughs> and we like to think we're They probably get up. sent directly to him. I yes. Mean, let's be honest. Yes. Um, but he... he um, Bo's Afraid was his yeah. film of the year. Um, and you'll uh, find out about ours. You will, very yeah, soon. Ever so soon. Uh, this was made on a budget of $25,000. And worldwide, it made $460. According I, to my sources online. Yeah, um, from, I think they might be a little skewed. Yeah, with, with interviews... That we've watched with John Waters, that sounds about right. I mean, he said this didn't do well at all. No, no. Um, yeah, I mean, would you say... It's quite funny to say that this is probably one of his more accessible films. Yes, this, I feel, lives somewhere between Pink Flamingos and something like Polyester. Or, or yeah. actually, like, Hairspray. Yeah. Where I feel people were expecting Pink Flamingos 2, mm -hmm. what else is Divine going to eat at yeah. the end of the film? And this doesn't kind of live up to that. It, it's no. shocking in parts, but if anything, it's a commentary on shocking arts yeah. and, and such. So it's kind of a bit more accessible, like Gary mm -hmm. said, in that sense. Not to say it's not consistently gasp worthy uh, yeah that's what i mean it's, it's ridiculous <laughs> to say this is accessible yes <laughs> um the film critic rex reed hated it uh to the point that in his review he asked uh where do these people come from where do they go when the sun goes down isn't there a law or something and the quote was posted on the waverly theater poster and in village voice ads for the film when it was released on dvd the quote was on the front of the box um, that's Rex Reed, who starred in Myra Breckenridge, so... Wow. I don't know how you could star in Myra Breckenridge mm -hmm. and then be shocked by anything. Yeah. Um, the premiere of Female Trouble took place at the Las Palmas Theatre in Hollywood, a former legitimate that had hosted first-run films, stage shows, and even an ice skating review, oh. uh, was a porn theatre by 1974. Oh, I see. It was hoped that Divine would place his handprints in wet cement outside the theatre in the style of Groman's Chinese theatre courtyard, but she accidentally stepped in the block of cement, rendering it unusable. Oh. Eight members of the Cycle Sluts, a local lever and drag performance group, were there to act as Divine's honour guard. And I'm gutted that name was already taken. <laughs> what a great band name. That would have been a great band name. <laughs> um, shall we talk about who's in it? Yes, in a section we like to call, Hey, I Know You. Now, we can pretty much do a group Hey, I Know You here. Yes. This pretty much this stars the Dreamlanders. Yes. Uh, the cast and crew that always come together to make John Waters films. Of course, where it sets it apart a little is uh, David Lockery as Donald Dasher. This is the last time that he'd worked with John Waters because he sadly uh, bled to death under the influence of PCP uh, before he could appear in Desperate Living. Uh, so he was in this and he was in Pink Flamingos. I believe he was maybe in Multiple Maniacs as well. Yeah, I think he was in everything really yeah. up, up until this, you know, this point. Yeah, and it's a lot more selective for Divine. So Divine was in... Uh, Pink Flamingos, Polyester, and Hairspray, and also was in the fantastic Lust in the Dust. Yes. As well. <laughs> Have you got any others there? For um, yeah. Multiple no. Maniacs, obviously, Multiple Maniacs, Mondo Trasher. Out of the Dark. 
Um, but yeah, um, unfortunately, Divine, absolute icon yeah. of queer cinema, queer culture, really just the pinnacle for, yeah. for myself. And um, unfortunately passed away rather mm-hmm. young in 1988, but pretty much, did, apart from Desperate Living, yeah, um, because he was doing, a, I think, a TV or a Broadway show, mm-hmm. or, or off-Broadway show, should I say. Yeah. At the time, every John Waters film, up until his passing. Yeah. And you got someone like Susan Lowe, who was in everything apart from A Dirty Shame and Pink Flamingos. This is yeah. This this is this is low budget filmmaking. Yeah. You're talking about this is gathering your friends together, paying them barely anything mm-hmm. to get this film out. It probably ha- it had a bigger budget than Pink Flamingos did because yeah. Pink Flamingos was a success. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still gathering all your mates together yeah. to have a bit of fun and um, uh-huh. <laughs> try and piece together a film. <laughs> Edith Massey was in Multiple Maniacs, Pink Flamingos, Desperate Trouble, Trouble even, and Polyester, and had a fantastic music career that you should all go out and listen to. <laughs> as did Divine, by the way. As did as Divine, did Divine. As did Divine. Uh, and someone else who also has doubled in music is Mink Stoll, and she was just in everything that John Waters made. Yes. Um, and of course, you know, doesn't just stop there. She was also... In the fantastic All About Evil, Monster Mash the Movie, Liquid Dreams. Uh, she was in The Crazy Sitter. Yeah, but I'm a cheerleader. <laughs> but I'm of a course. cheerleader. Um, eating Out, Drama Camp, Tr- Eating Out 2. Another gay movie. Sloppy Seconds. <laughs> Shriek, if you know what I did last Friday the 13th. Uh, Ming Stoll, one of my favorite actresses. She's been in so much and she's just fantastic. And just as much of a queer icon as John Waters and, yeah. and Divine. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but yeah, as as far as the the cast goes, I mean, I get, of course, Mary uh, Vivian Pierce was in everything as well. Um, yeah. As, as far as the cast goes, it is very much like you said, John Waters' friends getting together, and I think that's what adds so much charm to these films. Yeah, and why they can get away with what they get away with. Because it's just, you know, it's all done with the right intent. There's a sincerity to it. There's the sort of guerrilla filmmaking style. And it, it's people working together to create. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's written, directed, probably edited, yeah. all that business by John Waters. But it, it's, it feels like a community project. Uh-huh. It feels like people coming together and, and creating this yeah. art. You know, yeah. it's... I hate to spoil the end of the episode, but this masterpiece of queer comedy yeah. film, you know, uh-huh. I think it's, it's incredible. And you see it from the screen and you hear it too, because the budget was so low. Yeah. That the sound uh-huh. <laughs> equipment wasn't the best. And, and over time, it's also gained a court following and... I love that a film like this has a 7.1 on IMDb and like a really high rating on Letterboxd too, because it is the sort of film that a lot of people would look down the nose at and look at it as just a bit of trash that isn't worth the time. But John Waters has such a great cult following and it's nice to see his films get so much appreciation by modern day queer audiences. Yeah, because he is, in my opinion, a genius. Yeah. He's able to take this... And um, cr- create something very clever. Yeah. As well, he's he's a very clever man. He's mm-hmm. very actually very well read. And him and Divine would go and see all of the art films mm-hmm. together. Divine hated them. Um, Divine was way more into Elizabeth Taylor films. I agree. Uh, <laughs> but you know, John Waters is a very clever and very well read man yeah. and it shows and if people look past the shock factor they can find some very clever mm-hmm. films yeah well let's talk about why this one's so great and talk about our feature presentation look, the, the star of pink flamingos is here again it's divine she's got balls and she's got female trouble i'm a thief and a shit kicker and uh I'd like to be famous. Dawn Davenport is eating a meatball sandwich right out in class. 
Here she is, divine as Dawn Davenport, a feisty young high school girl. My parents are going to be real sorry if I don't get them cha-cha heels. Nice girls don't wear cha-cha heels. Do those never wear those ugly shoes. I told I you not to wear Yes, she had a lot of problems. And she found herself in big female, female trouble. So we get the opening credits with the iconic theme song sung by Divine, which you can get the mixed stole version on Spotify. Yes. I think there's some other cover versions on there. Um, but this version is sadly not available to stream. Unfortunately, because um, it does go off. It does. It does. And we start with Dawn Davenport Youth, 1960. Uh, Dawn Davenport, John Waters based this character on two delinquent teenage girls that he knew in high school. No. <laughs> Um, hilarious, the fact that these are all school kids and Dawn Davenport and her friends Conchita and Chick Clare are clearly all played by adults. Yes. Um, this is, the film is full of melodrama. There's definitely, within John Waters' films, and we discuss this a lot during Polyester, there's a great appreciation for Douglas Sirk and it's very obvious, especially in this film as well. Yeah, it's the, the melodrama... But also, I feel, as particularly this beginning part, is the delinquent teen teenager films, yeah. the teen exploitation. Um, Dawn Davenport has the same big brushed back hair uh-huh. as um, Tracy Turnblad yeah. will have in Hairspray. It's very much of, of that time where you did get the teen... I'm going to cut you after school. Yeah. Sort of films. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, so in Baltimore, spoiled delinquent high school student Dawn Davenport is seen going to school where she meets up with her friend Conchita to tell her she better receive her cha-cha heels for Christmas. <laughs> and uh, Conchita asks her, did you do your geography homework? She says, fuck no. Fuck homework. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares if we fail? Um, if anyone's seen the Drag Race episode... Of uh, the John Waters episode, yes. the Rusical. Yes. Uh, you'll be very familiar with what's going to happen with those Cha-Cha heels. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Make, I'm not even sure what Cha-Cha heels are. Do you think Drag Race may have played a part in a lot of people discovering John Waters? I don't know. I mean, I I'd like don't... to think so. I'd like to think it brought a new audience in. That... I was well versed, yeah, like really well versed before. Yeah, because I had Drag only Race. seen um, Serial Mum, and then you took me to see Pink Flamingos. Yeah, and then that Drag Race episode kind of made me even more curious to see the rest of the films. Yeah, yeah, and potentially he's hoping so. Yeah. You know, I do hope so that it brought new eyes yeah. onto his films. And if you're listening to this and you haven't seen the film, then please just. Pause this right now. Go and watch yes, it, and yeah. then come back. <laughs> um, Dawn is fat shamed after being she caught is. eating a sandwich in class, so uh, she snatches another girl's hair. She does. <laughs> it's wig is snatched. It's, it's obviously Google Divine, the the drag queen. He's a large man, yeah. you know, um, quite heavy set man. So to see him play a teenage girl. Yeah. And then get into this fight. Mm-hmm. It's it's perfection. Chickle, she's told off uh, in class for wearing a revealing top and chewing chewing gum. <laughs> it's our first introduction to her. And uh, yeah, when Dawn gets into trouble for eating the meatball sandwich and passing notes around, Conchita threatens to snap her to stab the snitch after class. Yeah. Oh yeah. The snitch. Uh, I can't remember her name. Um, she's like, I just want to get an education. <laughs> Which is, you know, I'm not being funny. As somebody who didn't go to the very best school ever, that, you know, when people did disturb the class, it was very off putting. Yeah. I wanted my education. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm I'm very much not Dawn Davenport. I, I was going to say, I was going to say, do you want to get stabbed after class? I mean, wow. they're not, they're, they're, Dawn Davenport is not a relatable character, in my opinion. Uh, the teacher drags Dawn to the front of the class and makes her write, I will not eat in class 50 times on the chalkboard. And after this, in an iconic scene, Dawn, Conchita and Chicklet are smoking and using hairspray in the bathroom and bitching about the school. They think everyone's jealous of them because of how pretty they are. <laughs> um, after school, 
Dawn goes absolutely berserk when, oh no, so after school she, uh, we cut to Christmas, don't we? The iconic Christmas scene. We do cut to Christmas. She, I mean, while she's in school, she makes it clear she better get those cha-cha heels and she hopes she gets arrested and tells the girls how much she hates her parents. <laughs> Perfectly setting the scene for her being with her parents um, the next day. Because on Christmas morning, Dawn brings her parents their Christmas gifts. Did you see what they got? Um, did we see what they got? No, because it really no. doesn't matter. <laughs> it, she couldn't give a shit. No. She just hands them over and that's it. Um, and they ask her to join in on a Christmas carol. And they sing Silent Night at her before she joins in at the end. And then uh, she goes under the tree, grabs the box that's shaped like a shoebox. And she... Goes berserk when they refuse to buy her cha-cha heels. Yeah, so she gets um, what I would call old maiden type yeah. shoes. I, I got similar ones. <laughs> uh, she goes absolutely berserk. Her parents tell her that nice girls don't wear cha-cha heels. And she destroys the presents, topples the Christmas tree on top of her <laughs> mother, and flees from the house in a nighty. <laughs> her mum's like, oh, Don, please. Please, Not on Christmas. Dawn. She's like, fuck you, fuck you. You're awful people. You're awful parents. This, we can't do it justice. We can't. This is cinematic perfection. Yeah. Lives were changed by this scene. Yeah. It's iconic. The The image of Divine stomping the presents in front of the Christmas uh-huh. tree. The image of Divine, uh, of Dawn's mother... Underneath the Christmas tree, uh-huh. after its top, you can only see her fucking head. Yeah. It's comedy perfection. And it's just the fact of Divine playing a teenager is funny as, as it is in itself. It's true. You know, that's hilarious as it is. But having her throw a tantrum on Christmas Day and having it be so over the top, <laughs> like a Douglas Sirk film on speed. Yeah. It's, yeah. It it's, has to be seen. Um, Have you seen that? Um, it's gone around as a bit of a meme. It's the film in a summer place, and Sandra D. I think Sandra D. is the one that gets the slap, or she slaps someone, and whoever gets slapped does like a twirl into the Christmas tree, and the Christmas tree falls on top of her. I don't know what it is, but I think we need to watch. It's it. it's iconic. Kind of, it's in a summer place, <laughs> uh, which is it sounds weird because I'm talking about a Christmas scene. Hey, we've seen Santa's summer house. Yeah. But I feel this is a reference to that film with the uh, high drama. Yeah. Um, it just, yeah, it's perfection. It's perfection. Yeah. This is what Christmas is all about. <laughs> um, Dawn hitchhikes a ride with a lecherous man, Earl Peterson, also played by Divine. Yes, in the perfect casting. <laughs> so, Divine, in, we get Divine in drag and out of drag. Yes. He drives her to a dump where they have sex on a discarded mattress. They do it a second time with over-the-top sound effects of Earl eating her out. And we get to see his skid marks on his underwear. Yeah, Earl's underwear was a rather prominent brown (laughs) streak at the back. It's just these little in-jokes that, I mean, divine fucking herself. That's hilarious. Uh, And she becomes pregnant. She does. Dawn becomes pregnant, but Earl refuses to support her. Uh, She calls him on the phone and away. Where she got the number from? He said, "You stole my wallet, you fat bitch." <laughs> it's me, Don. Don Davenport. You made love to me on Christmas morning. <laughs> he tells her to go fuck herself. Yeah. And then she, uh... which technically already happened. Yeah, it's but, true. You know. <laughs> and she gives birth to a daughter, Taffy, uh, whom she'll later go on to beat and punish severely. Yeah, she gives birth alone on a dirty sofa. She does. Uh, biting the umbilical cord off herself, <laughs> which is revolting. This is how that teen pregnancy film with uh, Kirsten Dunst. Hey, this... <laughs> anyway, you ain't watched it. You don't even know. <laughs> what was it called? What's it called? Who else is in it? I don't know, it's just Kirsten Dunst. You sure it's not like Carrie Fisher or someone random? No. Jamie Lee Curtis. Maybe, I feel like there's a like random Farrah Fawcett or yeah, someone like that. Someone. Yeah. Um. Susan Lowe played the receptionist at the beauty salon uh, while near the end of the term of her pregnancy. And she agreed for her newborn baby to be used in this scene. And John Watts claims that Susan's mother-in-law, visiting from England, was on the set. And the first time she saw her grandchild was during this scene. <laughs> and the umbilical cord 
uh, was made of condoms filled with liver. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Not very sanitary. <laughs> poor, poor, poor baby. <laughs> so the next era we get of Dawn Davenport is Dawn Davenport Career Girl, 1961 to 1967. This is when she works various jobs, including go-go dancing, and engages in criminal activities such as burglary and street prostitution with Conchita and Chiclet. That trio just never gets any less funny. No. Uh, the go-go dancing is incredible. It's giving Russ yeah. Meyer. Uh-huh. Um, it... <laughs> I love maybe more than Pink Flamingos. Mm -hmm. I really love Divine's outfits. In oh, yeah. Room. I think there's yeah. more of them. Yeah. And they're more I mean, over the top. Yeah, the final dressing, well, before the dog shit scene, the uh, court scene, the final dress during that section is yeah. obviously timeless. It's iconic. It's Everyone knows that image of the vine. Yes. Um, you know, I think that is probably her most iconic dress. Well, that would be Pink Flamingo. Yeah, no, that's what I'm oh, saying. That's what that's you're what talking I'm about. Saying. Excuse yeah. me, because there's but, a court yeah. scene in this as well. But yeah. I think there's quality over quantity in Pink Flamingos, whereas in this film, it is both. Yeah, it's like serve every, after serve. every yeah, every outfit's a banger. Yeah. Even the school outfit, even yeah. the the Christmas Day nightdress. <laughs> nightdress. I wish people <laughs> night dress like slippers. that more now. I want to dress like. That. <laughs> um. Yeah. And then it's Dawn Davenport, early criminal, 1968. And when it's just Taffy. Yeah, poor Dawn and Taffy. They don't get along too well, no. do they? <laughs> and uh, to be fair, Taffy is rather annoying. She keeps jump roping. She's jump roping indoors. Yeah. And uh, Dawn says, Taffy, please stop it. You're giving Mother a migraine. To which Taffy replies, Why can't I go to school? Why can't I have friends? And Dawn says, you can't go to school because I said so. I won't have you nagging me for lunch money and whining for help on your homework. There is no need to know about the president's wars, numbers or science. Just listen to me and you'll learn. And no little friends over here repeatedly repeating rhymes, asking flippant questions and talking in those nagging baby voices. <laughs> can't you just sit there and look out into the air? Isn't that enough? Do you always have to badger me for attention? Um... That's a little relatable. <laughs> so let's, Kids ask a lot of questions. Yeah, let's make something clear. The film goes on with her beating this kid up a lot. Yeah, that is true. Now, yes. We don't condone child abuse Absolutely on this podcast. Um, but the reason this is so funny is because... Not because child abuse is funny, but because in these melodramas from the 50s, the 40s, the 60s, Whenever there's any sort of parent-child drama, it's so over the top and melodramatic. This just takes that and just takes it even further. Yeah, that and it's so over the top to the point it can't be taken seriously. Absolutely, and that that is the joke. It kind of like Mummy Dearest, although yeah. with this, it's intentional. This is intentional. Mummy Dearest was not intended to be that funny. No, no, it, it it's a difficult area to sort of. Um, make comedic but I think that's what John Waters does yeah. so perfectly Yeah, because after Taffy bites Chicklet, Dawn goes on to say I've done everything I, a mother can I've looked in <laughs> I've locked her in her room I've beat her with the car aerial nothing changes her it's hard <laughs> being a loving mother you know <laughs> I mean that's that's how you get away with it, you know, the black comedy. Yeah. You know. They they take her upstairs and tie her to a bed in the attic. Um Conchita and Chiclet's entrance in the scene is one of the funniest things in the film. <laughs> and I don't think it's spoken about enough. They just come barging in with a the TV they stole <laughs> off the street. It's just so count. Um Dawn cuts up Taffy's jump rope and complains about her behaviour um some more. And uh Conchita's like, I'm glad I had an abortion. <laughs> Meanwhile, next door, hairstylist Gator Nelson, who works at the Lipstick Beauty Salon, is complimenting his aunt Ida on how hot she looks in a sexy leather suit. <laughs> Edith Massey plays Aunt Ida, and this is my favourite role of hers. It is iconic. She is on top form 
she is she should be on a flag every pride no, around the world she this should. character is the ultimate gay ally yes <laughs> she asks her nephew if he's met any nice queer boys in the salon he disappoints her by telling her he's still straight and would you like to have the honours of saying this <laughs> I kind of no, I kind of need a messy impression but she says uh, I worry that you're working in office have children celebrate wedding anniversaries the world of the heterosexual is a sick and boring life <laughs> It's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I, what can I say? Her outfit is stunning. It's um, a cat suit, isn't yeah. it? It's um very sort of open at the the chest, and we see her, with all due respect, struggle to get into it. Yeah, when we're introduced to her, but what? what just Edith Massey, just. I don't know how to describe her. She's one of a kind. Like I, a free spirit. Yeah. I feel. I, I don't know any way of describing her. Like, all of her performances are just her. Like, she just plays... I feel like she just plays herself, but just to the tune of the character that John Waters has written. Yeah. So not like in a Michael Cera kind of way. Like, there's always something that's a little bit different there. But it's so... It's just Edith Massey, and you can't complain at it. It's just so entertaining to watch. She's so herself mm. um, that you can't help but just fall in love with her. Yeah. And the acting, you know, the acting's not great. The delivery's not great. But that's not what we're looking for. There's no. a sincerity to it. And you just fall in love with the character because yeah. you fall in love with Edith Massey. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, there's no one in film history like her mm -hmm. at all. No, it's true. And again, remind us, check out her music career. <laughs> yes. Donald and Donna Dasher, the owners of the beauty salon, are looking for someone hideous to recruit in a new scheme to prove crime and beauty are the same. Of course, they choose Dawn after she says... I'm a thief and a shit kicker and I'd like to be famous. <laughs> and that pretty much introduces us to... Um, I don't think there's a big theme to the film. John Waters himself has said that it's not about anything. No. But if we were to interpret it, yeah, I would agree with what you said earlier about how it is about fame. Fame. And how far you'd go. Yes. And like, where... Where does the, you know, where does the line yeah. be, get drawn in terms of what people are willing to do in the name of fame? It's differently these days. It makes it way before it's time. Uh, I was going to say, it's aged very, it's aged brilliantly and mm. so ahead of its time. Because when you think about it these days, obviously, what is the, what is hot shit amongst people who watch Netflix? Crime. Mm -hmm. People fucking love it. Yeah. Um, and in a way that kind of you can kind of compare this to something like um, I don't know if anyone's ever done this before, but you can kind of compare this to something like Nightcrawler. Mm -hmm. You know the, that sort of idea of how far are you going to go to get a story? Yes. And this does that, but it does it with comedy, and it does it so well. Yeah. Is it better to be famous? Or infamous. Yeah. It's, you know, as a society, we know and remember the names of all of the serial killers. Yeah. There's numerous documentaries and films mm -hmm. based off of their lives. Yeah. But we can't, as a society, name any of their victims. Yeah. And... Ultimately, that's what John Waters is sort of commenting on, mm -hmm. I feel, in the film. And it's through comedy. And like Gary said, you know, John Waters has said there's no real big theme to the mm. film. But I think it touches on that subject. I think so. And something John Waters puts in a lot of his films is references to the Manson family. Yeah. And 
the idea is that Sharon Tate, who was a very famous actress, you know, not not top of the, you know, mm-hmm. um, acting food chain, uh, for want of a better phrase. Um, but Charles Manson is more famous than her. It, yes, yeah. it, you know, it's the Manson murders. It's not the murder of Sharon Tate. Do you, do you know what I mm-hmm. mean? Like, it's famous versus infamous. Yeah, and that that that's sort of seen throughout the film, but very much so at the end, you know. And we'll get to that when we get there. And as Asha's announced Dawn as their new customer, she chooses Gator as a new hairdresser, and immediately they get married. <laughs> After meeting him, uh, her wedding dress, see through. Yeah, nothing underneath. No, George W is in office. Yes, yeah. Um, it is. Yeah, again, just such an iconic look. So iconic. And um, Aunt Ida isn't too pleased, though. Is she's she? not. And she no. attacks the priest during the photo. She does. <laughs> There's also an appearance by Sally Turner. Mm-hmm. Now, Sally Turner was a Elizabeth Taylor lookalike, and she plays one of the customers in the Lipstick Beauty song. Uh-huh. Um, Turner also served as Divine's double in the junkyard sex scene between... Dawn and Earl. Oh, okay. And I think there's a lot of references to Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. Um, who was one of my absolute favourite actresses in those films. Um, there's the poster in Pink Flamingos. Mm-hmm. There's the lookalike. And I think Divine was a drag queen who always wanted to look like Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. And I feel in Female Trouble, Divine gets the closest to that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, which is a, a huge compliment. You know? During these scenes, not like yeah. when the mohawk comes in. Later no, on. <laughs> no, but it, it, closer than Divine ever did in any yeah. of the other films. Mm-hmm. Cl- closest to looking like yeah. Elizabeth Taylor. And famously, Divine said, because Elizabeth Taylor was somebody who who did put on quite a bit of weight um, as, they, as she grew older, Divine famously said and I'm not sure if this is true or not. I mean it's I haven't seen it recorded or anything. But apparently said I spent my life trying to look like Elizabeth Taylor and now she looks like me. <laughs> the uh the church has... which, I, <laughs> which I don't know if that's iconic or <laughs> kind of rude, but maybe it's both. It's both. <laughs> both. The church has backstory. Um, years after making the film, John Waters was contacted by divorce lawyers on behalf of a woman who claimed that her ex-husband, uh, who had been a church official, had received a substantial sum of money for allowing a pornographic film to be filmed in his church. Waters informed them that female trouble was most definitely not a porno and that he hadn't paid the man nickel for using the church to film its wedding scene. <laughs> Um, isn't Sabrina Carpenter going through something similar? Yeah. <laughs> a music video. <laughs> Did someone get fired? <laughs> she wore a rather scantily, <laughs> scantily clad sort of outfit. Cinematic parallels. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dawn Davenport, Married Life, 1969. In this era, we get a montage of Dawn and Gator's married life failing. Yes. Straight after they've been married. <laughs> uh, she finds him cheating on her. Ida empties her bin into Dawn's garden and Dawn throws a fish onto Ida as she's walking down the street. <laughs> so good. And we get such a great soundtrack in this film that we did with Pink Flamingos and it has these little montage scenes of things happening with the soundtrack over the top and it's yeah. just classic waters. It's, it's great. It's definitely. And then we get Dawn Davenport five years later. Five years later. 1974. Yeah. Today. day. <laughs> Um, Dawn and Gator. Who has? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, Dawn and Gator have sex yes. whilst uh, he's staring at a porn mag. And Dawn requests for him to use various items on her as a dildo, uh, so he uses some pliers. <laughs> he does. He uses a pair of pliers. And then we reintroduce the Taffy. <laughs> yes. Now played by Mink Stoll. Mink Stoll. <laughs> um, do we have a, an age for Mink Stoll during this? Um, during the making of this film, um, um, I can just have a maybe have a little quick look now. Oh no, I'm not. So she definitely isn't the same. Definitely age. not fourteen. Taffy's meant um, to be fourteen. 
Um, definitely not. Um, yeah. So Mink Stoll was born in 1947. 1947. So are we doing this maths? She was 20... She was about 28. 28. 28. Yes. Whilst playing a 14-year-old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and she's dressed in the same outfit that the younger Taffy was in. Yeah, it's, it's, uniform, it's giving uh, Shirley Temple. Yeah, it's giving um, Jimbo as Shirley Temple. That's yeah, that's exactly what it's giving. <laughs> I, I feel like this was definitely play on Shirley Temple. <laughs> yeah. um, she walks in on them and tells them how disgusted she is uh, by catching them in the act. And Gator asks her to suck his dick, and she says, "I wouldn't suck your lousy dick if I was suffocating and there was oxygen in your balls." <laughs> and we get this as we get a. Rather graphic close-up of Gator's genitals. Yes, yeah. Um, they they have an argument, and Dawn reveals um, she's now fourteen and is intellectually disabled, and that's why she looks like an older lady. Now, we obviously don't get the twenty twenty three politically correct term for intellectually disabled. Yes. Um, but I will say one thing: I don't think they were using it as a slur. I think they were using it as a medical term that would have been said around that time. Yeah, I I think it it's an unfortunate word that we, you know, was used back then and that we obviously do not use now. Um no. so I, I think we can separate that, but yeah. also, you know, it's not an excuse to use it just because somebody used it yeah. almost fifty years ago. Yeah, mm-hmm. doesn't mean anyone can use it now. Yeah, um, it's she looks like an old lady because of that, and because she grew up as a brat. Apparently. Well, yeah. Um, Dawn says that look in the mirror, Taffy. For fourteen, you don't look so good. <laughs> it's because you've been such a brat all your life <laughs> that now all that brattishness is showing in your face. <laughs> Mink Stoll is hilarious. Mink Stoll, this. Oh, I don't know. I love being stolen polyester. Yeah. I don't know. What her best I mean, before- Serial Mum's my favourite performance of hers. Oh, yeah, but of course. In in this, she is, she is iconic. She's and we just... don't always have to compare and contrast, do you? No, but she really overdoes the brat she thing. Does. Does. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's just so such a funny visual. <laughs> um, they start having sex again, Dawn and Gator. And uh, he starts shoving a carrot in her mouth, <laughs> and she's fuming and kicks him out. Take in mind, he was shoving pliers up her just earlier. Yeah. She was fine with that. At the salon, a customer is disgusted at how expensive uh, a haircut is. So she refuses to pay, and the receptionist tells her she'll need to give her hairdo back. So the gay hairdressers very flamboyantly walk over and completely ruin her hair. <laughs> they uh, <laughs> they pour a vase of flowers on top of her head and start <laughs> tearing her hair. <laughs> um, Donald and Donna Dasher, they entice Dawn to commit crimes by promising her fame, supplying her with drugs and money and photographing her crimes to stroke her vanity. Um... This all eventually leads to Dawn wanting a divorce. Yeah. And Dawn persuades the Dashers to fire Gator, who moves to Detroit to work in the auto industry. That's not after Aunt, good old Aunt Ida tries to get him a gentleman friend one last time. Yes, um, she does. Good old Ernie. <laughs> um, Aunt Ida says, well, Ernie comes to visit, and Ernie looks like... Um, a slightly more flamboyant, um, oh, what was it? Disco Stew from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh-huh. Um, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? It's driving, that's going to annoy me. Jerry. Jer- Jerry. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so he comes in and Aunt Ida says, oh, Ernie, have another pretzel for Christ's sakes. Wait till you meet my little gator. You two are going to fall right in love. And he says, my dear, I hope so. Are you sure he's gay? <laughs> I just says, well, I just use common sense. I mean, if they're smart, they're queer. And if they're stupid, they're straight. Right, Ernie? <laughs> and Jean's like, are you sure you don't want another pretzel? And he's like, I'm sure, Miss Thing. I'm sure. Pretzels <laughs> give you plaque. 
slightly before this scene, Dawn gets home and finds Taffy playing uh, car accident. Yes. And she said, how many times have I told you to play car accident outside? Yeah. John Waters says that as a child, he used to play car accident. Uh, he had his own stage at home to put on shows for family members and would put up a coat hanger uh, up his sleeve to pretend he had a hook for a hand. Uh, and she's told to destroy all of Gator's stuff and Dawn goes to uh, take a hot bath to wash away five years of marriage. <laughs> Gator goes home to tell Ida he's moving to Detroit to work in the auto industry and he's not interested in Ernie. No. At all. Uh, Ida begs him to stay and offers to get him a job as a female impersonator. <laughs> she writhes on the floor in hysterics as Gator yeah. leaves and it is hilarious. It yeah. is so funny. This is her Oscar scene. This is her Oscar scene. This is melodrama. This is just camp. <laughs> Gator goes next door <laughs> to say goodbye to Dawn. How does he say goodbye to her? Punch her in the face. <laughs> Which gives her a black eye, which the Dashers are delighted by when they come to visit. They are, yes. They they love how uh, hideous the neighbourhood feels and how they don't feel safe. <laughs> There's some but people in the background, and this is the, uh, you know, low-budget filmmaking. There are three people in the background looking at the Dashers, and they're like, what the hell is going on over there? <laughs> And then Dash is like, look at this disgusting... And the people behind are actually quite well-dressed. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, this is disgusting. Look at this area. <laughs> uh, Taffy meets the Dashes, and she just can't figure out why they'd want to take photos of a muffer. Uh, Dawn offers the Dashes some spaghetti. Donna wants two chicken breasts, uh, and Donald says he'll have a small bowl, to be polite. <laughs> Taffy wants some spaghetti, but Dawn refuses to give her some. Um, so she throws, so Taffy throws the bowl of spaghetti at the wall, Deirdre Barlow style. Deirdre Barlow. Spaghetti's meant to wobble. <laughs> Again, this is much to the uh, Dasher's delight. Yeah. Because they love all this chaos. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> Dawn punishes Taffy by breaking a chair <laughs> over her head, <laughs> knocking her unconscious. <laughs> And the Dashers ask Dawn to pose with Taffy's unconscious body <laughs> as if she's just, like, on a game hunt and she's just shot, like, a rhino. And she's got, got a foot on her back. <laughs> like, look at these photos. <laughs> and it's just these scenes where it's just like, like I said, you know, it's impossible to take this seriously. It is. And it is. I mean, this is, this is irreverent comedy. Yeah. This is black comedy. And it's that thing where if you have to be a very clever person to get it right, yeah, to get the tone right. I don't think for a single second that John Waters believes that, you know, hitting a child is an OK yeah. thing to yeah. do. What I do believe that when he gets Mink Stoll to dress up like a deranged Shirley Temple... <laughs> And has Divine break a chair over. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's comedy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it, obviously, comedy is different for different people, but to me, that's comedy. Yeah. <laughs> and it only gets more over the top when Ida, who blames Dawn for driving Gator away, exacts revenge by going to the house and throwing acid in her face, leaving Dawn disfigured. The Dashers uh, discourage Dawn from having corrective. Uh, cosmetic surgery and uh, use her as a grotesquely made up model yeah so we get the what i found hilarious is that uh um ida was still doing hysterics yeah as she's <laughs> just walking down the street so, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> we get the big reveal at the hospital don't yeah, we the, the face chiclet and conchetta are there the hairdressers are there they're all waiting around her like it's some sort of TV show. We've got some great dialogue. I do think the nurse steals the scene, though. Yeah. When she says, uh, she has asked me to remind you that she is, of course, without makeup. <laughs> <laughs> and then before the big reveal, she says, here it is, one hell of a rotten face. <laughs> the hairdresser's like, oh, I wish it happened to me. And me. Imagine how it'd look with my hair. Yeah. I'm getting a hard on. You know, beauty always gives me a hard on. <laughs> uh, and it's revealed. 
Yes. And, um, yeah, she, she just got burns to her she, face. She has. she has. And they completely overdo it. They're taking a the picture straight away. Uh, and they take her home. Yes. Um, where they've decorated the place in wrapping paper and bows. It's very um, Christmas present-ish. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, <laughs> they inject her with liquid eyeliner yeah. as well. Which apparently Divine actually was injected she was. with. I, t- I, I, there's stuff from Fira, and there's also a bit like, yeah. Okay, you don't actually have to be <laughs> injected with eyeliner. A nurse but, was on the set to supervise. Yes, that's true. But still, I, I don't think it's quite necessary. You already ate dog shit. I think that's enough for everyone. <laughs> Um, they kidnap Ida, don't they, in the yeah. dashes, and they imprison her in a large birdcage, presenting her to Dawn as a gift. They then give Dawn an axe to chop off her hand, <laughs> chop off Ida's hand as revenge for the acid attack. Which she does. Uh, which she does. I'm living for Dawn's outfit here. It's a sequined, heavily flared trouser with a matching bra, and then like a, um, I don't, I don't know how really sort of like hoop sort yeah of. like it almost looks like it should be a skirt but mm-hmm. it's just a, above um her chest and uh, yeah i'm living for this outfit she's got the axe and she cuts off yeah edith massey's hand <laughs> it's edith massey acting like trying to act like she's just had a hand cut off. <laughs> <laughs> so good taffy is distressed by her mother's criminal lifestyle and persuades her to reveal the identity of her father I want to leave. And Dawn's like, wow, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> Taffy finds her father. She does. <laughs> Quite quick. <laughs> Obviously, we've got... <laughs> the budget doesn't get to uh, like a two-hour film, no. so we have to get through this quickly. Finds her, fa- her father straight away, and uh, he's drunk, dishevelled, and living in squalor. Um, He... Unzips his trousers and reveals a prop penis <laughs> with red sores on the head before he vomits. Um, he then tries to assault her and she stabs him to death with a chef's knife. She does straight, she does, straight out of a cake. She does straight out of a cake. Um, <laughs> and that's that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the vomit uh, scene, Divine also took a dose of vomit inducing medication. Oh, no. And uh, it had no effect at first. Uh, it had no effect at all at first. Um, so the vomiting had to be faked. <laughs> and nurse was also on set to supervise that scene as well. Um, you know me, I hate vomiting scenes yeah. in films. I hate it. Yeah. Dawn, struts, Dawn struts down the street and a guy's glass eye falls out to the sound of Dig by Nervous Norvus. Yeah, so this is sort of a, a, a replica. Replica? Um, reenactment. A reenactment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for making me <laughs> out with my English, Phil. Um, this is a reenactment kind of of Pink Flamingos. The yeah. girl can't help it scene where everyone is horrified at Divine's existence. Mm-hmm. Um, but John Waters says during this scene, people were less concerned. Or they, they stared a lot less because of the burns on Divine's yeah. face. And they thought that this was somebody who had, you know, quite serious mental health uh-huh. issues. So they didn't want to gawp yeah. as she strutted down the street. Um, Taffy returns home and gives Ida a hook for her hand. <laughs> and Ida constantly asks her to let her out, but she doesn't. Uh, Dawn comes home and Taffy falsely claims that she was unable to locate her father and announces that she's joining the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> it's... I'm sure anyone who hasn't watched the film is listening. It's like, this is ridiculous now. <laughs> but this is what it is. I mean, this is it's a parody of melodrama. Yeah. It's soap opera. Mm-hmm. It's taking those elements. Because soap opera, melodrama, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It is ridiculous. You know? And it's taking that. And then even taking it further mm-hmm. so far that it, it's comedic. Yeah. Um, and like I said, there's a nuance to that. Not everyone can take these sort of subject matters 
and not be offensive with it. Yeah. And I understand people see John Waters' shtick as being offensive. Mm-hmm. But that's not actually true. It's yeah. very clever comedy. It, it's actually, in many ways, nuanced. Yeah. In the fact that it never takes it too far that it becomes unfunny. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at you, family guy. Yeah. Um, well, when Tuffy announced she's going to join Harry Krishna, uh, Dawn warns her if she does, and then she's going to kill her. <laughs> Dawn, now with uh, bizarre hair, makeup, and outfits provided by the Dashers. Yeah, um, uh, she's got a mohawk. mohawk. Yeah. Oh, iconic. It's just so, so Such iconic. Such a famous image of Divine as well. Yeah. Yeah. Just everything. So punk and out there and... Leopard print dress. Yeah. Oh, just really just perfection. Yeah. Um, She starts a nightclub act at Superstar Nightclub. Uh, Taffy returns home in religious attire and lets Ida out of her cage and sends her to go and call the police on her mother. To which Ida says, remember my offer. If you get tired of being a Harry Krishna, you can come and live with me and be a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> also, can we just remember, this is a 14-year-old girl that's doing all it this. Is, it is. It is. <laughs> um, when Taffy appears backstage, Dawn is horrified by her religious attire and fulfills her threat and strangles her to death. <laughs> And Dawn says she's finally dead. (laughs) (laughs) As part of her nightclub act, Dawn bounces on a trampoline, tears up a phone book and sits in a crib full of of dead fish, rubbing them all over herself, pretending to masturbate with one and pretending to eat one. So this, John Waters actually had Divine take trampoline lessons at a local YMCA. (laughs) Um, Divine was terrified about breaking his neck, but managed to do the trampoline scene in one take. Ah. One take, yeah. that iconic trampoline scene. Um, it's b- based on an act that was performed by Divine at San Francisco's Palace Theatre, where Divine would wheel a shopping cart full of mackerel on stage and hurl them into the audience whilst claiming responsibility for various high-profile crimes. Oh, yeah, because um, Dawn Davenport, she says, uh, Thank you, I love you, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my black little heart. You came here for some excitement tonight, and that's just what you're going to get. Take a look at me, because I'm going to be on the front of every newspaper in this country tomorrow. You're looking at crime personified, and don't you forget it. I framed Leslie Bacon. I called the heroin hotline on Abby Hoffman. I bought the gun that Bremner used to shoot Wallace. I had an affair with one Corona. I blew Richard Speck, and I'm so fucking beautiful I can't stand it myself. She then brandishes a gun. Yeah. Shoots the gun in the air and says, Now, everybody freeze. Who wants to be famous? Who wants to die for art? And the guy who... I don't know if this is in the credits or not, but according to IMDb, his name is Guy Who Dies For Art. He jumps up from the audience, says, I do, and Dawn shoots him. <laughs> Oh, it's like that TikTok. What's that one? Who wants some? Who wants some? I'll have some. <laughs> um, and yeah, and uh, Dawn Davenport starts shooting people. She does. Yeah. I think we need to go back a bit and talk about this trampoline scene because okay. we need to do that a little more justice. Like, it is iconic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's divine who, a large man, being able to... Use the trampoline. And these are some great tricks. Um, it's a backflip. It's a backflip. It's a backflip. Yeah. Just wanted to make it clear how cunty that scene is. Um, yeah, the police arrive to uh, to subdue the crowd, so they start shooting people. <laughs> they Cause that's what police do. Yeah, they shoot several audience audience members, um, but allow the dashes to leave when they claim to be upright citizens. <laughs> As in, you know, <laughs> straight white. Yeah. Couple with money. Uh-huh. Dawn flees into a forest, but is soon arrested by the police and put on trial for murder. Um, another, like, really weird image of Divine in this get-up, running through the forest <laughs> and, like, washing in the river. <laughs> uh, at the trial, the judge grants the Dash's immunity from prosecution for testifying against Dawn. 
They claim innocence and completely blame Dawn for the crime she committed at their behest. And they also pay Ida to lie on the witness stand. One big theme throughout John Waters' films is the courtroom. Yeah. And apparently he loved, when he was younger and seemingly allowed to, he loved going to courtrooms and watching Mm. courts (laughs) in process. I mean... Right, wherever you get your kicks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose that's why these courtroom scenes are so good. They are, yes. All from experience. Well, I mean, you kind of get a version of one in Pink Flamingos. Mm-hmm. Um, you get one here, and then you really definitely get one in Serial Mom. Yeah, like an actual. Now I have a budget. Uh-huh. This is an actual real courtroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, although Dawn pleads not guilty by reason of insanity, the jury finds her guilty and sentences her to die in the electric chair. She gains a new relationship in prison. She does. She does. Um, a fellow inmate, Ernestine, who is distraught on Dawn's execution day, <laughs> the bailiff comes in and says, Okay, lesbians, I caught you. Bumping pussies is a violation of jail rules. <laughs> Like, it takes a genius to write shit like yeah. that. It mm-hmm. really does. I'm sorry. It really... I couldn't write shit like that. Yeah. Um, as a priest says a prayer and Dawn is strapped to the chair, she thanks her fans for her notoriety before being executed. Yeah. And we get, like, an echoey version of the theme song. And that's Female Trouble. Yeah. Yeah, we get a freeze frame of Dawn's electrocuted face. And uh, yeah, that echo- echoey version of Female Trouble plays. And that is the life and times and death of Dawn Davenport. It is. Yeah. She lived. She served cunt. <laughs> she died. Did a bit of crime. <laughs> died. Um, I de- Just real black comedy perfection. Yeah. I know I keep saying it, but yeah. it is. There's a lot of filmmakers where we've said, oh, that's very John Waters, it's very John Waters, it's, you know, very inspired by John Waters, John yeah. Waters-esque, and so on. No one could make a film like this. No. No one could make a film like this and have it work as well as it does. It's so irreverent. John Waters. Yeah, yeah. It's so irreverent, but so clever. Yeah. In how far it takes things, um, it's very clearly a, you know, a parody of melodrama, yeah. a parody of teen exploitation and exploitation films that came before it. Um, it's a wonderfully camp film. Yeah. Um, hysterical, really queer as fuck. Uh-huh. Um, just really, just one of my absolute favorite films of all time. Yeah. It really is. Uh-huh. I, I just, it's not enough words That's for me to use to praise it. Well, then let's give it some awards. Let's give it some awards. The biggest queen for me, it has to be Aunt Ida. Oh yeah. It has to be. I yeah, mean, good on her. Yeah. The, the, everything she did for the gays. She did a lot for the gays. She was um, staunchly pro-homosexuality. Yeah. <laughs> Despite, I assume, not being homosexual herself. Yeah. Um, I did want to put a word in for Taffy, though, as well. Yeah, good old Taffy. <laughs> she, she never minced her words, did she, no, old Taffy? No. <laughs> Uh, biggest gasp, I got the acid attack. Yeah, I went with um, Dawn biting into her own umbilical cord. <laughs> um, best dialogue, uh, there is no other option. It has to be. I worry that your working offices have children celebrate wedding anniversaries. The world of the heterosexual is a sick and boring life. I completely agree. And that's camp. Uh, I, the entire film is camp. Everything. But it has to be the Christmas cha cha heel scene. It's, yeah, Christmas, cha-cha heels, peak camp, dawn, Davenport in school, yeah. just high camp. Ratings, I give it 10 hard-ons for beauty out of 10. I gave it 10 sick and boring heterosexuals out of 10. 
And masterpiece, trash to piece, trash space or a camp pod bunch of fern. It is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It's available on Blu-ray and video on demand. And if you enjoyed this, check out Pink Flamingos. Yeah, absolutely. I said um, if you enjoyed this, check out Polyester. Yeah. It's somewhere between the two. Desperate Living's not too far away from it either. Not any John Waters film, really. Yeah. You'll find if you you know, if you find humour in this film, mm-hmm. you'll find humour in all of his films. Yeah. If you're going outside of um John Waters, I'd say maybe check out Women in Revolt. Yeah. The sort of Paul Morrissey, Andy Warhol films. Yeah. Anything by Russ Meyer. The, that that seventies queer. Uh-huh. Yeah, Russ Meyer, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, we are Horror Court Trash Over on Facebook and Instagram, Horror Court Trash on Twitter, we're on TikTok as well. I'm Dead at Gaz Night 2 on Letterboxd, Gazmo205 on Instagram, and GazCruise92 on Twitter. I'm Chris Barker823 on Instagram and Letterboxd. And one of our big achievements throughout our time releasing episodes for this podcast is we formed Gasp Horror Film Festival, which is a film festival dedicated entirely to minority filmmakers. And if you don't know what it is uh, by now... If you're a new listener, then go to Gas Power Fest across all social media. Check that out. Yeah, coming back to Manchester in June. Yeah. And uh, give us a rate, review, subscribe on iTunes, like a follow on everything else. Do you want to know what we're releasing for the rest of the year? If the answer's no, tough shit would tell you. Christmas Eve, we'll be back with our Christmas bonus episode. And we're discussing best Christmas ever. Um, yeah. The title does not describe the film. <laughs> um, I can assure you it's the opposite end of the spectrum to what we yes. just discussed. <laughs> and because uh, we are releasing that on Christmas Eve, there will be no new episode on Tuesday. Instead, we will be releasing our latest original versus remake on Friday the 29th of December, which will be Assault on Precinct 13. And then... On New Year's Eve, we will be releasing our 20 best horror films of 2023 episode. And for anyone who hasn't heard one of those episodes before, it's a roundup of our favourites of the year. where We discuss favourites across other genres as well, give some awards out, and it's just a lot of fun. So, check it out. Yeah, it's a nice way to round up the year and... I believe 2023 has been yeah. a phenomenal year for cinema in general. So, yeah, very much looking forward to discussing that film. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll be back same time, same place on Tuesday. Bye. Wait, no, we won't. We'll be back same time, same place. I mean, on you Christ- literally just said it. <laughs> what a 300 rock. episodes in. Free and I mean, I'm leaving that in. 300 episodes in, and today's the day I made the mistake. Wow. Yeah. We'll be back same time, same place on Christmas Eve. Oh, bye.